Hello and welcome as we continue our reflections on the lectionary readings. This week, looking at Sunday, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, September 25th, 2022. Let me read for you the introduction for Sunday. Consideration of and care for those in need, especially those at our gate, visible to us of whom we are aware, is an essential component of good stewardship. It is in the sharing of wealth that we avoid the snare of wealth. It is the one whom death could not hold, who comes to us risen from the dead, who can free us from the grip of death and greed. Let us use the prayer of the day. O God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading for Sunday comes from the Old Testament prophet Amos in the sixth chapter, verse one and then four through seven. The prophet Amos announces that Israel's great wealth is a cause not for rejoicing, but rather sorrow because God's people have forgotten how to share their wealth with the poor. The wealthy will be the first to go into exile when judgment comes. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. Here ends the reading. We continue again this week to read from the prophet Amos, and I remind you from last week's reflections that the theme for Amos is God's justice. Amos prophesies after the nation called Israel splits into two kingdoms. Amos prophesies primarily to the northern kingdom, which is still called Israel, and not specifically to the southern kingdom now known as Judah. As with all of God's word, everyone can find something in it to apply to our own lives. Listen again to how last week's passage began. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land. And then how it ended, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. This week's passage shows Amos warning the people not to think that their apparent security and lavish lifestyle means that Yahweh God is happy with them. While this passage, as well as most of Amos, certainly reads like judgment, it is important to read it with a biblical understanding from that place and time, Israel of the 8th century BC. In our 21st century Western civilization, for whatever reason, we have decided to believe that God's judgment proves that God no longer loves us. For the place and time of Israel in the 8th century BC, God's anger is not the opposite of God's love. Rather, God's judgment is an expression of God's love. Because God loves all people, when one person or group of people cause others to suffer, God gets angry. God's anger and judgment exist in order to get people to change their harmful behaviors. God does not delight in being angry, quite the opposite. Over and over, the Old Testament tells us that God delights in showing mercy and forgiveness. God expresses anger in order to bring about repentance, change. Therefore, judgment is not abandonment, nor does it lead to eternal condemnation. In today's vernacular, I might call it a reality check. 
One caution for we who are reading this today is to discern how this passage speaks to us directly, rather than assume that it was only meant for those people back in that time and place. If we start to read the Bible as if it does not apply to us in any way, shape, or form, then why read it? Another word of caution. We are not to read the Bible to see how it applies to other people. We are to read the Bible and ask, how does this apply to me? Maybe even have a conversation with God and ask, God, how does this apply to me? This passage may be a portrait of a life of faith that's gone horribly wrong at some point. Amos is noted as a prophet to the northern kingdom, as I mentioned, although this opening verse from verse 1 shows Amos's wake-up call applies to all people. Alas, for those who are at ease in Zion, and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Zion was another name for Jerusalem, which was the capital city of the southern kingdom, Judah, and Samaria was a name for the capital of the northern kingdom. Therefore, everyone, north and south, all of the the people of Israel, can apply Amos's words to herself or himself. Amos verbally paints a picture of God's people who are feasting and taking their leisure without paying any attention that others of God's people are suffering. Amos addresses people who claim to belong to the Lord and who trust in the Lord to protect them and keep them at ease and secure, yet who behave in a decidedly ungodly manner toward the needy and the poor. That is, when people in authority tax the poor and then use their taxes to support their own lavish lifestyles. The leaders are invested with authority in order to help the people, and the people in turn are to be invested in God's mission for Israel. Instead of using their authority and power to tend to the welfare of God's people, those who are in power have used their privilege to seek their own welfare. One commentator said, if you like the prophet Amos, you don't understand him. As I said earlier, everyone can apply Amos's words to herself or himself. The psalm for Sunday is Psalm number 146. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captives free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Here ends the psalm. Last week, um, like last week's psalm, this psalm begins and ends with the Hebrew phrase, Hallelujah. Translated as English, perhaps, as praise the Lord. And since the Lord is all capitals, <coughs> it means Yahweh. So like last week, I told you, this is praise Yahweh. Verse 2 says this plainly. I will praise the Lord, Yahweh, as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. The way one lives, one's life, is itself an act of praise. We're called to live out God's values of truth, justice, and responsiveness to those in need. Verse 3 and 4 shifts the focus to human rulers and government. The stories of even the greatest leaders of Israel and Judah, such as Moses and David, demonstrate their fallibility and dealing especially with the needy and the poor of society. 
On the other hand, God is attentive and reliable. Verse 5 reads, Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. This does not mean humans will always be happy. Life proves that outside circumstances cannot always make us happy. And if they sometimes do make us happy, that happiness lasts only as long as those circumstances. Verse 6 reminds us that God is the foundation of all creation, who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them. All of creation praises God in the Bible, which includes, although it's not limited to, humans. <clears throat> in the Bible, it is not the rich and powerful who receive God's special attention. It is the outcast people in society. Verses 7 and 9 leave no room for doubt that the Lord gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. God's plan for humanity can be described as healing bodily and spiritual illnesses and restoration to wholeness. God's love and righteousness is demonstrated through the faithful who commit themselves to reconciliation and restoration of all relationships. Living in a broken world where disappointment, anger, and injustice remain all too common, we are assured that God's kingdom is different. We are emboldened to hope and to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today's reading concludes by acknowledging the eternal rule of God from generation to generation. Hallelujah. The second reading for Sunday comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Timothy is reminded of the confession he made at his baptism and of its implications for daily life. His priorities will be different from those of people who merely want to be rich. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich, to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unacceptable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Here ends the reading. Timothy traveled with and learned from the Apostle Paul. We might describe them together with the words relationship, mentorship, parent-like apprenticeship. Today's passage especially appears to be written by a mentor figure to a mentee figure. We are reasonably certain these pastoral epistles or letters were not written by Paul. We cannot be certain if they actually went to Timothy. 
although the bond between mentor and mentee is obvious within today's reading. The letters in general, and today's passage, specifically involve serious human thoughts, deep emotions, everyday actions. The word of caution is to not interpret these verses as some sort of impersonal doctrinal commandments. We need to read these verses as if coming from an older, loving, parent-like figure giving life advice to a younger, impressionable, childlike figure who is venturing out into the world, which is sometimes cruel and deceitful. Sometimes on the car ride to or from the university, our son will engage us in deep conversations about life and how or why we have made the choices we have made. I confess I love these conversations. And at the same time, I'm a little anxious that my half of the conversation may not provide what he will need as he matures and will soon make his own way in the world. I wish I could put within him all the wisdom and skills he will need. Yet, I know some of what he learns is going to be by trial and error. When we, when we read this passage with that kind of foundation well in place, I think there are some of these verses that are based on godly advice. Like if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Or the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Or pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, and others like that. At the core of all of those messages is relationship, mentorship, and parent-like apprenticeship, geared toward one's multifaceted growth in the faith. And in my humble opinion, as the second part of Redeemer's mission statement is to grow in faith, and as we are all senior citizens in this community, I think we never reach an age where we stop growing accordingly with godly advice. Sunday's Gospel comes according to St. Luke in the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 30, 31. Jesus tells a parable in which the poor one is lifted up and the rich one is sent away empty. Jesus makes it clear that this ethic of merciful reversal is not new, but is as old as Moses and the prophets. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and he was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm, so that those who may want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. 
the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This parable sounds like a harsh teaching about judgment on those who are rich. But what does rich mean anyway? As of 2019, 9.2% of the world, or 689 million people, live in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 per day. In the United States, 10.5% of the population, or 34 million people, live in poverty. Poverty in the USA is described as one person living on $12,880 annually or less, which if that person works a 40 hour week every week is $6.20 an hour. Up to a family of four living on $26,500 or less annually, which if that person is working 40 hours a week all year long is $12.74 per hour. Comparatively, I could be that rich man, dressed in nice clothes, who feasted sumptuously every day. And you might look at me and think, yeah, he, he feasts sumptuously every day. Yet the lesson in this series of Jesus' teachings, and there is a series, there's the prodigal son, the dishonest manager from last week, the rich man and Lazarus this week. There's a series of Jesus' teachings which sound like they're about money, but they're less about money and more about what the people are doing in this story. All of these teachings follow the story of Jesus and the Pharisees, where Jesus was invited to a banquet at the leader of the Pharisees' house, and they start grumbling against Jesus. Apparently, Jesus has invited in some unwanted or uninvited people, tax collectors and sinners, this man eats with tax collectors and sinners. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, the irony of that story is that Jesus was a sinner. He was homeless. He was penniless. He was one of those people. And yet he was invited to the dinner given by a leader of the Pharisees. And when Jesus is saying this, he's still at that house. He's still among all of those same people telling all of these stories regarding attitudes toward money and other people. In the middle of all of this back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees, Luke writes this phrase. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed Jesus. So Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by humans is an abomination in the sight of God. Hmm. Equating wealth with virtue is what, in my humble opinion, Jesus means when he says, what is prized by humans is an abomination in the sight of God. Jesus is not condemning hard-working people, earning a living, supporting their family, and so on. There is, however, a note of caution against accumulating wealth and possessions simply for the sake of having more and then believing oneself to be better than others based on the number of acquisitions one makes. That is, like someone from my college days once said, the one who dies with the most stuff wins. Well, life in the kingdom of God is not a contest. The focal point for today's parable is less about the man being rich and more about his complete apathy toward the poor man, Lazarus, who lays at his gate, to whom the rich man did not even offer table scraps, the things that fell to the floor. The rich man's total apathy prevents him from showing any respect at all to Lazarus. Even after death, the rich man expects Abraham to send Lazarus to serve him. Let him dip his finger in the cool water and cool off my tongue. 
Failing that, the rich man went to Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers, lest they end up just like him. <laughs> he still is treating Lazarus with no respect. In, in my humble opinion, it's worth noting in the story, the rich man is not named by Jesus, while the poor man has a name, Lazarus. Jesus' parable gives respect to Lazarus by giving him a name. By not giving a name to the rich man, Jesus allows his identity to be attached to his acquisitions and his attitudes. And once they are gone, the man has no further identity. Even in the afterlife, he's just referred to as he or him. The Bible is filled with teachings about helping the poor and the hungry. Rich people, especially, were expected to share from their abundance according to God's word. Benches were set up at the gates of the rich people where the poor and the hungry could wait for help. People like to quote the Bible, saying, God helps those who help themselves. Well, the problem is, that's not in the Bible. The Bible does not say that. Although I can find plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about the virtues of helping others. The idea that Luke would have Jesus telling this story is, is really interesting to me because the Jews had no concept of heaven and hell, at least as we understand them. The Jews believed that everybody ended up in Sheol after they died. The concept of Hades comes from Greek mythology. Hades in Greek mythology was the god of the underworld. Luke was a Gentile, perhaps he was even Greek. And Luke's cultural influence may be playing out in this story in regard to the afterlife, especially because of the mention of Hades. Theologically speaking, we do not teach that our afterlife is dependent on us. Christians teach that life after death is dependent on God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. As recipients of God's grace and through our baptismal promises, as mentioned in Timothy, we strive to live according to kingdom of God principles. The rich man in this story apparently is not even trying to live according to kingdom of God principles. Even as he must have walked past Lazarus each time he leaves and enters his own gate. The focus of this parable is on virtue in this life. What we do with what God has given us as resources. Virtue is not determined by our own wealth or what type of employment we might have or our prestige or social status or even gender. Rather, Virtue is determined by character and how we treat others, especially when no one else is looking. There are some needs that can be met, and there are others that cannot. There are some things that we can control, and there are some things we cannot control. Still, our responsibilities to one another in this life are revealed in God's word and they grow out of the sense of God's grace and love, which has already been given to us. Thank you for joining me again today as we look at the readings for the 16th Sunday after the Pentecost, September 25th, 2022. I hope you're having a great day. Take care. And God bless.